True whitetail fanatics know the legendary bucks. A number of special deer come to mind when I think of some of the all-time greats. I remember the Hanson buck, the Hole in the Horn buck, and Mel Johnson's buck just to name a few. For some reason, the stories of high-ranking whitetails often involve bizarre circumstances. The story of the Jordan buck is no exception. In fact, it could be argued that this is the strangest whitetail story of all. Jim Jordan harvested this deer in 1914 uh, near the town of Danbury, Wisconsin. Even a century after the Jordan Buck's demise, this stunning 5x5 ranks number two on the Boone and Crockett's all-time list of typicals with a net score of 206 and 1 8. He held the official world record from when he was panel scored in 1966 until Milo Hansen's buck shot in 1993 was ruled number one by BNC in 1995. In effect, the Jordan Buck was the world's top scoring typical for 79 years. The Jordan Buck has unmatched bounds. There are no abnormal points and total deductions are only 3 and 2 eighths inches. Half of that is with the G4 tines, which would have matched even better had the right one not been injured in velvet. As the score sheet shows, every measurement is elite. This rack has the beams spread in time length to rank among the greats, but is largely due to its stunning mass. The smallest beam circumference is 6 and 1 8 inches, and the largest being 7 and 4 8 inches. Now let's get to the story. In the fall of 1914, James Jim Jordan was a wiry 22-year-old with a deep love for the outdoors. Descended from one of the first non-native families to homestead in the area, he'd grown up near the logging town of Hinkley, Minnesota. But after him and his wife got married, they recently moved a few miles east to Danbury, just across the Wisconsin line. On the morning of November 20th, 1914, Jim and an older friend, Eucas Davis, headed out in search of fresh venison. According to the North American Whitetail article, Jim toted his Winchester model 1892. With it, he frankly was undergun. This light hitter has less energy at the muzzle than a 243 Winchester has at 800 yards. Today, the cartridge isn't even legal for the use on Wisconsin deer, but it was all Jim had and he'd use it on any whitetail he could find. About a mile below town, as Jim neared the north end of Round Lake to his west, he cut ear tracks near the train tracks. They indicated northward travel, and one set was huge. Jim followed, hoping to get a crack at the deer. From the south shrieked the loud whistle of a northbound train. As Jim watched, several does' heads popped up from the grassy banks 50 yards ahead, and then, as they bounded away, so did a huge buck. When Jim got his iron sights on the giant, he shot and shot and shot. He felt at least one round hit solidly, but the massive buck kept following the does. Jim dug around in his pockets and found one more round. Then he anxiously began following the oversized tracks. He found a bit of blood and occasionally caught a glimpse of the buck ahead, but he didn't dare chance a shot just yet. He knew he had to make this last shot count. He shot the deer. The deer ran a, a, across a river uh, where it collapsed. Uh, Jordan then realized that he had forgot his knife and had to return back to his carriage to get a knife to field dress the deer. When he returned, the deer was gone. Uh, the deer had uh, drifted down the river uh, in the current, so following down the river for considerable distance, he eventually found his deer along the river. After tagging this giant buck, Jim wanted to get him out, and this is where the wild ride begins. In a nearby town, Webster, lived part-time taxidermist George Van Castle, who agreed to mount the deer for $5, which is equivalent to about $120 today. The antlers in short cape were delivered, and the hunter awaited completion of his trophy. But soon after Jim handed off the deer, George's wife died. The taxidermist moved to Hinkley, Minnesota, which was 30 miles from Danbury. When Jim learned of this, he wasn't too worried, but after many months with no word from George, Jim traveled to Hinkley to see what the holdup was. That's when he learned George had moved again, this time to Florida, and he left no forwarding address. Jim was devastated. How could he hope to find a deer rack halfway across the country with nothing more to go on in the 1910s? Now fast forward into the half century to 1964. Jim was 72 years old and still lived in the area. And yes, he still laminated his loss. He told this sad story many times. Over that span, two world wars, the Great Depression, and technology had reshaped life, and deer numbers had exploded. 
Hunting now was more about the recreational than survival. Also, in the 1950s, the Boone and Crockett Club had implemented its monitor scoring system and four typical whitetails, the biggest the recently scored, the Breen Buck from 1918, had in succession become the world record in this category. Nothing much happened with the deer for five more years. Then Bob read an article detailing the Boone and Crockett scoring system. He decided to try his hand at scoring the antique buck and came up with a net of 205 that was three inches more than the Breen Buck, which had become the number one whitetail in 1960. Bob reached out to a Boone and Crockett measurer out of the Twin Cities. They agreed to meet, but for some reason that meeting never took place. Then against all odds, that same scorer was driving through the area when he recognized Bob's name on a rural mailbox. Sure enough, it was the man with the old antlers. In short order, the scorer put a tape to the rack coming up with a net score of 206 and 5 8 Bob shipped the antlers to the Boone and Crockett panel for scoring and on February 28, 1966, the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, George Church signed off the panel score of 206 and 1 8 and there was a new number one typical, the Sandstone Buck. But aside from the score, all else was still an enigma. While killed in 1914 was written on the back of the mount, there was no name for that matter, was it even a Minnesota deer? At some point before having the antler scored, Bob ditched the shabby remains of the cape, revealing a full skull. He eventually got around to showing it to his uncle. When his uncle laid eyes on it, he was shocked, for he knew he'd seen it before. Yes, believe it or not, Bob's uncle was Jim Jordan. Jim's claim initially seemed crazy to Bob. Sure, he'd heard his uncle tell of that lost buck, but how could this possibly be the same deer? Upon investigation, Bob learned the mount had come from the attic of an old house in Hinkley, the same one George Van Castle had lived in briefly before heading to Florida. In the killed in 1914 written on the back of the discarded mount was a match to Jim's 50-year-old story. Jim was ecstatic that this buck had miraculously been recovered. Bob finally concluded the antlers must be his Uncle Jim's Wisconsin giant, but what would it take to convince Boone and Crockett of that? Jim had no field photos or other real evidence, only his story. Desperate for support in 1970, he hand wrote a letter for publication in the local Grantsburg newspaper, describing the hunt and appealing for aid from anyone who could help him substantiate the events of 56 years prior. However, nothing ever came to fruition from the local newspaper publications. Behind the scenes, the wheels were slowly turning. Those involved with the deer were pleading Jim's case with Boone and Crockett. They believed the sandstone buck was his long lost trophy and that he and Wisconsin should get credit. In December 1978, Boone and Crockett finally agreed. The deer was to be listed as the James Jordan Buck from Burnett County, Wisconsin in 1981's eighth edition of Records of North American Big Game. Jim's dream at last had come true. Now, this announcement should have brought great joy to the hunter, his family, and friends, but it was a hollow victory because just two months prior to the Boone and Crockett's decision, the 86-year-old hunter had passed away. Most deer hunting stories end with a happy hunter kneeling beside the kill. But in a way, that's the point at which the real hunt for the Jordan Buck begins.